Methodist Church. Great to be together and sharing this video with you. Good morning, beloved, and welcome to worship. This morning, I wanted to start worship with a blessing from the works of John O'Donohue. He, uh, it's, it's a book I found sort of accidentally a few weeks ago, and I wanted to share this prayer and praise this morning that's called Matins. Somewhere out at the edges, the night is turning and the waves of darkness begin to brighten the shore of dawn. The heavy dark falls back to earth and the freed air goes wild with light. The heart fills with fresh, bright breath and thoughts stir to give birth to color. I arise today. In the name of silence, womb of the word, in the name of stillness, home of belonging, in the name of the solitude of the soul and the earth, I arise today. Blessed by all things, wings of breath, delight of eyes, wonder of whisper, intimacy of touch, eternity of soul. Urgency of thought, miracle of health, embrace of God. May I live this day compassionate of heart, clear in word, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, and generous in love. Let's just take a few moments to listen to some music and give this day our hearts, our minds, our bodies, to our God in prayer. Today's scripture uh, comes from Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man there named Zacchaeus, he was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead, climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He's gone to be the guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, Half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to him, Today 
salvation has come to this house because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. Here ends the reading of the scripture. Thanks be to God. Every act of love will be of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Do you remember this song? Zacchaeus was a wee little man and a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior walked that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. Well, if you didn't learn that one, you didn't go to vacation Bible school. That's all that there is to it. It was a song that we sang a lot in Sunday school and vacation Bible school because it was such an access accessible story for kids, wasn't it? To imagine someone who was short enough, small enough of stature that he couldn't look over the heads of the crowd. Now, for those of us who are somewhat vertically challenged, we can totally understand that. We have all kinds of, of uh, techniques that we use, oftentimes if you've never been around a short person, uh, in order to get around squeezing through crowds or to, to step on a step so we can see around. Or I remember going, when I went to the Holy Land, there was all the guys that were with me were really tall and, and so oftentimes I'd end up behind them trying to squeeze my camera in between their bodies so I could get pictures. So I totally can identify with this scene. Well, today as we talk about Zacchaeus, our, th our theme is how do we look at people in a way that we really see the way that God sees, that we see who they really are. Uh, or as Brene Brown says, people are hard to hate close up, so move in. In the text this morning, Zacchaeus is um, almost a comical figure in terms of his shortness of stature, stature of the point that he is obviously not someone who's held in high regard in the culture. Uh, he runs uh, ahead of Jesus, which is not a very dignified thing to do. He climbs up in a tree, again, not a dignified thing to do. Uh, and when Jesus looks at him, there's a couple things that stand out right away. Uh, Jesus calls him by name boy, there's a detail that's sort of missing there. How does Jesus even know his name? And, and not only that, the second thing we know is that immediately people start to grumble because uh, Zacchaeus is someone that Luke pairs these two words together all the time in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, tax collectors and sinners. It's like a 
a, a, an automatic uh, category of being that if you're a tax collector, you're in the, in the sinners category and tax collectors go with sinners. Now, for those of us who live in this time, it's a little bit hard to understand perhaps the entire social context. Um, so let me just give it a, a shot here for a minute. First of all, uh, Zacchaeus was a fellow Jew, but when the Romans came in uh, to take over, they did something really pretty clever uh, in terms of collection of local taxes. Rather than having someone from the government go in and do it, someone who was from the, the, uh, the powers that be, the, the oppressive government, what they did was that they uh, sent, uh, they gave the contracts to local people who would bid for the contracts. And they would say that they would collect X amount for this amount of money. Now, that meant that instead of people grumbling toward the government for all these local taxes, and there were lots of them, you couldn't really move one way or the other without paying a, a bridge toll or a tax on goods and services, even if you're just crossing over territory. Uh, there was a thing of uh, taxes pretty much on everything you could possibly think of. So definitely it would be something that the people that had more would be more upset with than the people that had nothing. Uh, some scholars suggest that um, the concern about taxpayers and sinners might have been more of a concern during the time of Luke than it was even perhaps at the time of Jesus. But w whatever the, the entire context was, what we do know is that uh, people would bid to have these contracts to collect the taxes. And then it was a little bit like a big pyramid. We'd have the chief tax collector, which Zacchaeus we know is, is this, a chief tax collector. And he would hire contractors below him who would collect the taxes on his behalf. And at each level, of course, they're want, wanting a little bit more of a level of profit. So the, by the time you got to the chief tax collector, they would be the one who would benefit the most from the collection of the taxes. So they were not admired as part of the culture. Chief tax collectors in particular, um, without even knowing anything about them, were under suspicion because it was open, of course, to great abuses. Um, and oftentimes they would have people that would coerce people to give their taxes. So it was just not a good thing. And then when you think of somebody who is from your own culture, your own people, they didn't even really include them as part of being a real Jew. Because how could a real person, a real, a real a faithful follower, uh, a faithful descendant of Abraham, how could they possibly extort money out of their own people? And so they were greatly and widely hated, and particularly by the folks who had more than enough. So in this context, we have uh, the people grumbling already that Jesus is eating. We've heard this before, Jesus eats with tax collectors and sinners. Uh, and a, a couple of chapters previous to this, we have this story of, of somebody who was greatly respected in the culture. Do you remember the one about, about the, the young man who is very rich and he's kind of a ruler of the people? And uh, he is greatly respected because he, he, seem, he tries to follow all the law, he goes to temple regularly, he gives the proper sacrifices, and yet he's restless about his life. And so he comes to Jesus and says, these are all the things that I do, Jesus, and what else must I do? Now, maybe he wasn't really wanting to hear the answer that Jesus was going to give. I wonder about that, because sometimes I think um, we think we know what question we should ask, and then when we do it, we think, oh, maybe I shouldn't have even asked that one. But when he asked Jesus this, Jesus gives him a long, hard look and says, go and give away all you have, all your, all your riches to the poor, and then come and follow me. And the scripture tells us that the man went away sad. So here's someone who um, was, was accepted by the culture, who was respected by the culture, who was thought to be a really round, roundabout good guy. And he goes away from his encounter with Jesus, greatly saddened. And then we come to the story of Zacchaeus. Now, nobody would have to know anything about Zacchaeus except for the fact that he was a tax collector. And in Luke's words, tax collector and sinner go together. Um, in order to make a, a very strong opinion about him. 
So immediately people would, it, he would be somebody that not only would people um, go the other way when they saw him, but they wouldn't speak to him, he wouldn't be invited to anyone's house, he wouldn't be accepted in social groups, just because that's what he was. Now it really wouldn't matter whether he personally was extorting or cheating or doing any of these things, but just the very fact that he was a tax collector put him in this category. So we come to this story and we have uh, Jesus going and being among the people. And he runs ahead, of course, in this ridiculous scene of maybe I can even see him kind of hiking up his robe and running up and, and going up into this sycamore tree, which uh, I found out is kind of like a, a, a low grade kind of a fig tree in the Holy Land. And it was a food that the poor people would eat. It wasn't very high quality, but it was one that grew everywhere. So he climbed up and it had really good branches for climbing on. So he climbed up in this tree to look, look uh, and see Jesus. We don't really know why. Again, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's missing out of this story. But in this place, uh, he, he wants to at least see Jesus. And, and maybe he's heard about him. Maybe he's really feeling his isolation from the people. And he wonders if, of, of who, who Jesus is and, and has heard maybe about his teaching. But whatever his background is, we don't know how in the world when Jesus came up to him, he intentionally looks up in the tree, calls him by name and says, come down because I must, it's like an imperative, hurry up, come down, I must come to your house today. Uh, that's totally shocking. And not only does he jump down on the tree and take Jesus to his house, but he does so rejoicing. It's a great, great picture in my mind of this man of short stature. Um, I don't know why that was important, except that, you know, people were a lot shorter then. So when you think of people being short in Jesus' time, they were really short. So uh, he takes Jesus to his house and they have this conversation. And uh, he blurts out, before Jesus can say much of anything, he blurts out um, these words that, that um, I give uh, from all that I have to the temple. I pay, I pay the temple. I pay my tithe. And if I cheat anybody, I, I um, make it up four full times to them. Now, there's a, a little bit of a um, theological or biblical studies argument here, because uh, in the Greek, it's in present tense. So the question is behind this part of it is, is Zacchaeus saying, if I have done all those things, is, is it a conditional thing? That if I could have done those things, or if I do those things in the future, then I'll make sure and make amends. Could be. It could be that he's in realizing that Jesus is taking the time with him, realizing that Jesus represents um, something bigger in his life that he's been yearning for. That maybe this very act of Jesus coming to his house has just simply turned his life uh, around. Or it could be that what he's saying to Jesus is, I'm already doing these things, but it doesn't really matter. People have already decided who I am. Whichever way that is, it, it is interesting, but it doesn't necessarily of, of use to us in this story, except that Jesus says these words that, again, in our time don't necessarily mean anything. In the Abrahamic culture, relationship, clan, uh, connection within the generation to generation meant everything. And if you were cut off from the people, from the clan, from the temple, from those who were your co-religionists or your co-culture, then you were totally cut off. And what Jesus says at this moment is really, really important to the story. He says, you are Abraham's child. And in these moments, he receives Zacchaeus, in a sense, back into the fold as if he had never been away. So my question for myself and for us today is, who is it in our lives um, that, we, that we know as Zacchaeus? Who is it that goes perhaps ahead of us or ahead of Jesus and climbs up in the tree because they're anxious to, to see what this is all about? And who is it that we turn our backs on or, or won't give the time of day to or totally shut off before they even have a chance to open their mouths? Um, I, when I was first thinking of this, I, I started with a pr pretty good list. I mean, I was listing people who, who uh, I probably, if I saw them on the street, I might maybe even cross the street to go the other way. Um, in this particular time of, 
of political unrest in our country. There's been a lot online lately about what people are doing to um, destroy or vandalize um, people's political signs out in their yards, like stealing signs. Or there's a story this morning of someone who would put, apparently put razor blades on the bottom of somebody's sign. So when they picked it up to put it in a different place, their hands were cut. Uh, I mean, just, there's just terrible things going on. And it isn't just this party or that party, it's both. Uh, so obviously we have people in our lives that we already decide who they are and we decide without ever talking to them, not perhaps without ever meeting them. Shh, quick. Okay. I have help. So who would those people be in those li- in our lives? Um, there was another article, I think it was in the New Yorker this week about a woman who realized that every time she saw somebody out and about without a mask on, she made a, a really strong judgment about them. And so her inner dialogue was all about <laughs> And so there's this cartoon kind of thing going on about every time she meets somebody and how she's making this judgment and how her emotions are really stirred up. And she not only judges them, but she's angry at them. She thinks of them as being a terrible human being. And, and she kind of got s- stopped up short when she realized that that's what she was doing. Um, because without any information to go on, without any... Uh, Without any conversation with this person, she was prejudging them and, and also, in a way, condemning them. So as I was thinking about different examples in other people's lives, I had, of course, to come to my own life. And the story that, that came to me is one about um, the several years that I've worked in the prison system, working in the education department. And when I first started going there, uh, one of the first things that I noticed up at Deer Ridge is that there are some people that you go in to the education wing and, you know, they're all wearing the same color of clothes. They wear jeans and a blue shirt with inmate written on it. But some of those people, if you put them in a different outfit and you put them outside the prison walls, you wouldn't think twice about them. But then there are the other guys. (laughs) There are the guys that immediately when you see them, it wouldn't matter what they were wearing. You would think, Ugh, I think I better give that a little space. So when I began there, our, my friend Janet Naram, um, she and the rest of the education folks had somebody particularly in mind for me to work with. And when uh, we were first talking about him, she said, well, you know, he's, he's a, I'm not sure she used these words, but basically she was telling me that he was kind of a, a diamond in the rough. And, and he was going through his GED program and he needed a lot of extra help um, in a lot of variety of ways. But they said, you know, the thing that we worry about about him is he's, we've kind of thought of it that when he gets out, he's the most likely to be homeless. Um, okay, I'm up for a challenge. So I, I meet him, I'm gonna call him Jamie. Uh, Jamie, when I walked into the, the room that we were gonna meet in, uh, was very tall. He was very, a very large man, and he had a, a he had a shaved head, and a, had a beard about out to here, and he had tattoos not just on his arms or and, and on his neck, but he had them on his face, and some of the symbols that were there were obviously they were prison tattoos. This is somebody who had been pretty much in and out of prison since he was a kid, and if he were to raise his voice. I don't know, I challenge anybody to not be nervous. If I had seen him on the outside, uh, no matter what he wore, even if he wore a three-piece suit, I think I would have definitely walked on the other side of the road. But we started getting to know each other. I think it took him just a little bit, a little bit of time to to get adjusted to to me as a person and to know that I was somebody that he could trust. Uh, But whereas at the first, I was trying to concentrate on not just staring at his facial tattoos. By the end of the uh, two and a half years that we worked together, um, I I really hardly even saw the tattoos. Uh, We worked together and um, he told me little by little bits and pieces of his story, not not to manipulate me, which, you know, I was always on the lookout for that if he was going to try to manipulate me into thinking that he was just misunderstood. Rather, what I understood from him and what I learned from him, and I'm, I'm pretty much convinced that I learned far more from him than he learned from, from me, was that the system that he grew up learning how to survive in was one that's just diametrically opposed to everything that I grew up with, everything that I value. And he learned survival skills in a way 
that the skills that he learned in order to survive in the culture on the streets and the culture in the prison were there to help him survive, for him just to live from one day to the next. I, I learned that inside this great big man, there was somebody who really wanted to succeed and he really wanted to please the teachers in the education department. As they gave him attention, as they praised him when he did things well, uh, as we worked one-on-one -on -one and he learned how to do some writing and he learned how to do some public speaking and, and he began to learn some skills, it was as if a person that was totally unrelated to what I could see on the outside was, was blooming. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And it has helped me to see people in a different way when I see them and I immediately make a judgment. Now, I'm not successful 100% of the time, not even close, because there are still some people that just the fact that they're waving a certain flag or that they're, that they're speaking in a certain way or that they make certain statements out in public that just I struggle with. But I think the invitation that Jesus gives us today is to look as Jesus does beyond our first judgment. Now, it doesn't mean that we're going to be coming uh, into agreement with each other. It doesn't mean that we are going to invite somebody to our house for a meal. Although, you know, in the ancient times when somebody came to your house to share a meal, it meant that there was a relationship. You didn't invite perfect strangers. You didn't invite people you didn't agree with. You didn't invite people uh, that, that had what you would have called a moral crisis. Uh, so what Jesus was doing was really quite revolutionary. It was not even at all surprising that people were critical of what he was doing because all the people that you didn't share table fellowship with, Jesus was sort of inviting himself to their homes and seeing them in a way that is hard for me to see. Seeing them in a way that changes hearts. We're edging closer and closer to uh, the election and I wish I could say that after a certain date in November, everything would calm down and people would just kind of shake some of the anxiety off and shake some of the hard feelings off and, and see each other as neighbors again, but I'm not sure that's really going to happen. Our, our country is divided and subdivided and sub-subdivided so many times and fractured so many times in the last few years that, that we are definitely a divided people. But in this time, what I hope we can arrive at by listening to Jesus, by looking in a different way, would help us to realize that even if we can't be in agreement, even if we're afraid of the same things or the, or the opposite thing, that if we look at one another and try to understand each other rather than just prejudging one another, it's pretty hard it's pretty hard to hate someone that you have shared communion with. It's pretty hard to hate someone whose story you have heard. It's pretty hard to hate someone when you look at them eye to eye, even if we're both wearing masks and we're six feet away, and we actually find out what they're feeling and what they're thinking and who they truly are. It doesn't mean you have to be best friends. It doesn't mean you're, ever, you're going to decide that, oh, they must be right. What it means is that the way our God sees the world is different than the way we see it. God's love is not conditional. And you notice the other thing in the story that I think is really important, that Jesus didn't say, if you do this, 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 then you will be a son of Abraham. If you change your ways, you will be a son of Abraham. Uh, if you change your job, you will be a son of Abraham. Jesus never, ever says that. He says, I must come to your house today and I must share this meal with you. And it changed Zacchaeus. I think it probably changed the disciples. 
and maybe it even changed Jesus a bit. Because when you are in relationship with someone, even with our differences, it means that it changes the world a little bit at a time. Beloved of God, let us love one another, for love is of God. Amen. Thank you.